the objective for me to, to be here today was not to give you an answer, is not to give you a silver bullet. Um, so that puts me in a really great position. What I need to do is challenge your thinking. And I, if I can get half the room disagreeing with me and half the room agreeing with me, but you talk about it over a beer tonight, then I've achieved my objective. <laughs> Getting to know your customer. It's something that I hear all the time, whether it be organizations such as yourselves or whether it be f um, FMCG companies, whatever. We want to know our customer. We want to get closer to our customer is the more modern version of it which is great because when I do focus groups or I do immersion stuff, I always try to take the client along so they get to get to close to their customer and nine times out of 10, they're always, whoa, 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 I didn't mean that close to my customer. Show it to me in a PowerPoint slide. There's two very important distinct parts to the statement getting to know your customer. The first bit is getting to know. It implies an ongoing action. It's not I got to know my customer, it's I'm getting to know them. The customer changes. You've changed. If I ask somebody who knew you 10 years ago and sees you today, they'd say, yeah, he's got a bit grayer, might put on a few pounds, but he's actually different because he's got married, he's got kids, or whatever the case may be. Customers change, needs change, fears, insecurities, promises, desires, they actually change. So we need to keep a finger on the pulse of what's going on. And the your customer part, your customer part is always the most interesting bit because this is where a lot of people fall over. You say to a company or a brand or an organization, who's your customer? And they quite often start with a statement, anyone who, that's not a customer. That's like Winston Peters looking for who's my, who do I want to get vote? I want everyone to vote for me because I have a message for everybody. You do that, you will miss. So you have to ongoingly get to know your customer, but first of all, you need to define who that customer is. And today I want to have a little bit of fun with challenging you in terms of knowing what you know. The reason I love doing what I do for a living is I get to be proved wrong on a daily basis because I have assumptions about what my consumers do or what a client's objective is. I build up a thought process and then I get paid to run out and go and find out whether that's right or wrong. And the most enjoyable part of the one has been the one you get wrong because what that's done is it's challenged all your preconceptions. It's opened up so much more opportunity because otherwise if we knew it, or wouldn't life be boring? I know I'd certainly be out of a job. But, so I wanna have a couple of, of thoughts. Gen Y, that's where I've spent a lot of my research time in understanding them. And the reason I love working with these guys more than I do working with grown-ups is because these guys are actually less full of crap than grown-ups. Grown-ups are brilliant at rationalizing behavior. We're brilliant at sitting there going, nah, nah, don't like that. Whereas kids, you can actually call them out on it and they'll have some fun. So, today's youth are, finish the sentence, give me some stereotypical things that you believe in about kids of today. Lazy. Thank you very much. Okay, they're lazy. Keep going. Impatient. Impatient. IT savvy. IT savvy. Busy. Busy. Old before their time. Who said that? Can someone put that? I can keep my eye on you. <laughs> Who said that? Bored. Love it. Anything else? Connected. Connected. Yep. Anything? Brash. Brash. I just thought that was English people. Impressionable. Impressionable. <laughs> touche, sir. Touche. Confident. Inquiring. See, outside they said you lot were really quiet. I was stressed. Sorry, I said you for today, sir, not you. <laughs> All right. Lazy, impatient, bored, brash, impressionable, stressed. On the flip side, inquiring, confident, um, savvy, busy. Impressionable. I like that. I like the IT thing. Okay. And you know what? You're all right, and you're all totally wrong. And that's the fun part. I did a big youth study, and also con uh, put together 10 years' worth of work. And I'm just going to go through that quickly to try and highlight why some of you are right and some of you are wrong, 
or rather that you're all right and you're all wrong at the same time. What we understood is that people are torn between their choices. So we didn't go out and do a study of youth to understand how many hours they were watching you know, TV versus playing on the PlayStation or so forth. That I mean, that's all just a little part of it. What we really wanted to do is we wanted to pull people apart by their choices. So in this particular case, we asked these guys a series of questions, kind of a so set of Sophie's Choice questions. Because if I know the choices that you make when you're in that decision, I will know you better as a person than if I know what you're going to do right now. Because the thing is about the youth market, and when I say youth, I'm talking 15 to 29, is that fundamentally a 15-year-old boy hasn't got a bloody clue what he's going to do next weekend, let alone what he really feels about a certain brand, topic, or activity. And he's going to go to school next week on a school dance, he's going to fall in love, and all that's just going to go completely out the window anyway. So what we did is we put these people into choices, and what we found is we ended up with six clearly distinctive segmentations. And they were pulled apart by their attitudes to family, pulled apart between their attitudes to their career, pulled apart by their views on materialism, pulled apart by the view of is it all about me or is it all about others? So it was some very simple things. But I'm not going to go into great detail about it because it will bore you if I go into this massive segmentation. I just want to kind of give you some highlights, if you like, and have a little bit of fun with it. The first thing that you notice about them is we've given them these really uh, wonderful little avatars to try and show what they might look like. But that's also irrelevant. The first thing I want to draw your attention to is the size in the circle. What we found is that pretty much you had, you had these groups Smallest being 14% and the biggest being 21%. So straight away, the question I asked you being, is actually a trick question. All youth are, but everyone's able to come up with these broad sweeping statements. I would love it if someone turned around and says, there's no such thing as a typical youth. Because there isn't. The other thing you notice is the gender that goes along there as well, in terms of some have more female or male kind of general attributes, but there is no one thing there that says all boys are or all girls are. And the other thing is also the age group. And I don't want to get too scientific into, uh, sorry, bore you with, like, with too much data, but fundamentally what you'll see is that there is quite a good split of the sample at the younger age, but as the older we get, we get a little bit more narrow in our beliefs. We get a little bit more kind of family focused or we get a little bit more career focused, which is why everybody in this room probably battles with that work-life balance dilemma that we all have, that being pretty much that grown up thing. But as we're growing up, we have a whole set of ideals that we kind of hang on to. And then we either get beaten down with reality or maybe we get a little bit more optimistic with, with reality as well. The thing is, the trick here is that People move. The older they got, the more likely they would go out of a certain segment and into something else, depending on life. Life being, do I have a successful university time? Have I got a crap boss? Have I found a, an employee? That, you know, sorry, have I found a boss that, I can, that inspires me or am I just in a job? Have I found a teacher that gets me going? Am I succeeding in sport? Have I fallen in love? Have I found alcohol and drugs yet? A combination of all the above if I went to a Targo. You know, all these things mean that I change as I grow up. More so at Gen Y. No more so biolo biolog biologically, physically and mentally and emotionally do we change than we are when we're below 30. For men, you could argue it's until we're below 50, but I'll get onto the men topic very, very shortly. So what's important here is to understand that there's a modality. I've spent 12, this part of 12 years studying this audience, and I am still learning. I have a framework with which I operate in, that experience has given me, but I'm still learning. And the level of detail that changes may appear to be small but it is so significant. I'll give a very, very small example. Everybody's online. Everybody's socializing online. Everybody's talking via text. Every communication is digitized. Do you know what the youth really love? A letter. If I asked that question 10 years ago, people, kids would have turned around and said, letters are dull, they're boring. It's what mum and dad get. 
But with this digital age and the lack of human meaningful content that exists, all of a sudden that traditional nostalgic meaningful contact is so much more important. It heightens. Subtle. But understand what that means. It means that the desire to connect is so much greater than it was 10, 15 years ago because it has been taken away. It's not taken away from me since I was robbed it. It's just society is changing. And shit, I'm only 18. I'm still trying to figure it out too, you know? So when the bank sent me a letter that says, Dear Spence, would you like this? That feels so much better than just this really cool, funky advert trying to tell me something. But anyway, family-focused people. I'm quickly just going to run through these guys because hopefully it might try to shake your attitude about who I really understand as my customer. One of these segments is called family-focused. Why are they call family-focused when I talk about Gen Y? Because the defining attribute about these guys is that their single most common driver is that they, w ambition rather, was that they wanted be to be a parent before their age of 25. Stressed, confident, expensive, busy, lazy, brash. No, no parenting in there. But we don't think of that, do we? 16%, so every, out of every 100 kids, 16 of them want to settle down. Oh, before your time, madam, absolutely correct. That's this group, very much so. Yeah? And the way they shop and behave and what they want is very much old oh, before their time in the way they behave. They love media, though. They want to keep in touch with everything that's going on. Don't want to miss out. Ladder climbers. These people driven, as the title would suspect, by career. This is like any 24-year-old advertising agency exec you've ever met, right? These guys also strong around media as well, but they do this thing what, which we call fundamentally mash mashing. So they're basically in their lovely Greylin flat that they can't afford the rent for with 15 other people because it's the only way they can actually live in Greylin. And they're there checking their emails while updating their social media face while also watching TV but not on live, it's actually in streaming. So they're absorbing three different sets of media, all doing different things. Whereas one of the other groups will see that they mesh, they'll have the media going on, but it's all the same. Confused? Yes, hopefully, because it means you'll start thinking, shit, maybe some of these broad sweeping statements I've taken for granted, maybe I need to challenge these just a little bit. I don't know, but the important part is to find the ones that stick. So these guys are absolutely brilliant. One of the things I love about these guys is he was the only group of people that controlled their Facebook <laughs> profile. Now what these guys are doing is they're controlling their outer brand. Yeah, they buy the clothes that their bosses wear, they buy the things that the cool kids buy, and they're controlling how the world sees them. Yeah, sport is a very unattractive thing for these guys because it puts them in a position of looking crap. So they don't necessarily try to do it unless it's actually what the boss is doing and it's in a work environment i'm in the work team because all the good people at work are in this so if i want to get ahead i've got to be in this motivations for participation are sometimes wide and varied the other group money equals status very self-explanatory uh, a thing i love about these guys is these were, and a lot of people are like this, but very few people admit it, is that these guys openly suggest that they only go out with attractive people when they get out when relationships are going bad. And a lot of people may think it, very few people necessarily say it. But these guys, again, social media is very, very important for them, but these guys, they're not controlling it, they're sucking everything in. Basically, these are the guys who want the most amount of friends. They love sport. They love sport because it's about one-upmanship, it's about status, it's about winning and beating. So for these guys, these are the mad guys running around on social sport, screaming and shouting at each other and beating the crap out of each other because they desperately wanted to win, where fat sods like me are wondering when the beers are being served. My favourite group um, is the one that I hope that my um, son grows up to be, um, the, the idealist. Um, this is the biggest percentage, this is the biggest group. And what I loved about these guys was that when I did this study about eight years ago, we updated this, this group were only 10% of the audience. And we called them the conservatives back then, but right now that name has a whole different meaning. But fundamentally the essence was still there. These are about kids who really want to do good for others. They have grown up in a world where they've known nothing but war. They have experienced the GFC. They basically have no hope of buying a property if they live within 20 kilometres of this spot here. So their life is very different from their parents. 
so they're starting to form their own ideal things and it's very much around fairness and participation these guys love sport not from a winning perspective but purely from a social aspect it's about doing good for their body but it's also about actually sharing an experience with you as well and being part and being central. These are the guys that organize the teams. These are the guys that go out of their way, for example, in a work situation. They're the, the team leader at McDonald's or Pack and Save, for example, yeah? They really do care about what's going on around them and sport plays a significant role in that at a sociability level, yeah? For these guys, it's not necessarily the winning that takes part for them. You know, uh, there are a beautiful attribute as well as you were the only group that stood out that said these guys wouldn't let a mate drive home drunk. Not one of the other groups showed any significant rise in that choice. I hope my boy grows up to be this. The only issue you have is as you notice that in the age groups there, over half of them, uh, over half, uh, uh, 15 to 29, but when they, when they 15 to 19 rather, but when they get up to 25 to 29, there's only about 18% of them left, only 18% of this group are that age. Fundamentally, the older they get, the more browbeat they get. And reality kicks in, and you know what? A little bit of uh, uh, ladder climbing probably wouldn't help, wouldn't do me any damage right now. But again, there's a change. Spontaneous spender. My, my major favourite, because sometimes when I present this group, I feel like I'm some kind of evangelist for the youth market, showing them how balanced and you know, well presented they are, and, and then they're not lazy and they do these good things. But then again, it's really nice to have a group that actually are a bunch of lazy bastards and do all the stereotypical youth stuff. And these are my spontaneous spenders. They're the smallest percentage of the group. They are lazy, absolutely. And we've got her positioned there with a bottle of RTD in her hand. Why? Because that stereotype applies. They're not going to put themselves out there. For them, it's about now, now. They don't even have a social life that basically goes beyond knowing what's happening on a Friday with a box of Coleys. They go into work, they leave at 5 o'clock every day. They're not there for a career, they're there to get a pay packet. They're skint before the pay packet gets through the following week because it's all short-termism. Yeah? These are the guys, uh, Malcolm's gone, so I can talk about Vodafone. Um, remember Vodafone had that campaign to about 10, 15 years ago, which was the uh, $2 top up? Yeah, basically that came from an insight that I worked on that Frenchy said this audience here will spend, if, the, if their average top up is $20, they'll get that on a Sunday and they will spend it by a Wednesday, except for two bucks worth. They'll make it stretch the entire weekend. So. The value wasn't, let's get the greatest prize, the value was in that last two dollars because that's where they knew they could control it. So, this is these guys, very typical youth. And these guys are solitary savers, I say forget about these people altogether. You know what these guys are? Um, we used to call these guys lost in the mall back in the day. And, and the reason is, I don't know if you've ever, you know, you've all got a, a cousin or a nephew or something who turns at the family barbecue. It's all right, Dave, how's it going? <laughs> What's happening? Nothing. What do you want? Nothing. What's wrong? Nothing. It, it's just there's nothing there. <laughs> okay? Um, stressed, lazy, bored. This is these guys. <laughs> okay? Um, you know, it, and we called them some sp solitary savers because we were trying to find something positive about them and the only thing they seem to do is actually s save money, which is actually a lie. It's actually that they don't spend money is a more accurate term rather than they actually say. They don't have a lot of money. They just haven't found their crap yet, fundamentally. And as you see again, as they get older, in the 25 to 29 group, fundamentally, it's about 9%, or as what I call IT, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just a joke. <laughs> okay? But the idea of this, guys, is to actually kind of bring a bit of humour. It is the afternoon after all, and I was late. Um, but it's to kind of highlight that really... You can't do these broad sweeping statements around demographics and generations. You will lose. And just even highlight that even more, when we started looking at the geography of this, fundamentally what you're looking at is yellows and greens pretty much say, say an even spread. So as you see this family focused thing, you get in an even spread. But then when you start going into ladder climbers, all ladder climbers live in Wellington and Auckland. 
So if, you know, if you're Coca-Cola and you're trying to catch all the cool kids and you're doing an above the line campaign on TV, you've just wasted about 90% of your tarts. Because they ain't living in certain areas. And these guys are a marketing trap. These guys are the ones that all the brands go after because they think they're cool. <laughs> the only reason they're cool is because they keep trying the new stuff. Which means then when they're not buying your stuff, you call them fickle. No. <laughs> the reason they bought your stuff in the first place is because that's the type of audience that they are. Money status guys, you see a lot of, yeah, you see not so much living down in Otago. The idealists all over the place, but predominantly a lot of uh, time in Wellington. And I do find this actually, particularly in youth research, and I apologise for any Wellingtonians in the room. But what we found is that any time that there is a sense of kind of good or better or moral or justice or fairness, Wellington will always over-index in terms of where the sample lives. Except one taking care of your neighbour, it totally under indirects in that one. So it's really weird, it's like you guys don't care about what's going on next door because you're too busy worrying about what's going on in the world. <laughs> but again, you start to see this yellow-green thing, spontaneous spenders, patchwork going over there, and solitary savers. No wonder they're bored when you look where they live, there's nothing happening. So when they move out of those areas and into some of the urban areas, maybe they fit into some of the different demographics. Now, I'm not trying to be a smart ass. All right? And I'm not trying to educate you about Gen Y as such. What I'm trying to do is just give you a little bit of a, a, a different way of challenging what you really d know. When you say you know this audience, and I know the youth audience will be very important to pretty much most of you in this room, and yet all your stereotypes were absolutely correct. They were in all of those segments that you saw. But where they really lived is what's important to you because then you can target those people. If you try to target youth or certain a demographic, you will miss. Advertising agencies are the world's best slash worst at this. You, you go and try and buy media to target 15 to 29 year olds, you end up buying media that targets 15 to 40 year olds. I mean 15 to 20, 40 is terrible, 15 to 29, just think about it. Put a 15 year old boy next to a 27 year old woman and tell me they're the same. But if we understand some of their behaviours and motivations, then we understand what we're after. And this data, you can, I can, I, you've, you can all have a copy of this to study because some of it's quite interesting for you. But it just gives you some, some numerical stuff there around you know, where their share of assets and debts and cars and you know, you know, phones, what they're drinking, as you'll see, their sports drink. No surprise, they're over-indexed with our money status and idealist guys because they're the most active in the sport category as we define it and that's important, it doesn't mean that the other guys are not out playing, but in terms of sport as we defined it as an organised structured activity, that's there. You know, their consumption around that, I'm still really, if anyone knows the brand manager at Bluebird or a chip company, I'm dying to find out why corn chips over index with the status guys, so please give me a lead. But, you know, and, and here, and this is by no means a media plan, um, kind of shows viewership of, of magazines, TV and, and radio and so forth. And the one thing I'd like to just throw out there, because I'm all about not broad sweeping, you know, not making broad sweeping statements in order to truly understand your customer, I'm about to make a broad sweeping statement. There's a one that says, you know, uh, youth of today are not watching TV. Bollocks. Sorry to put no final point to it, but they are. Okay, and as you can see there, it's yes, there is some decline going on and the way that they're watching it is changing. But if we take some of these big statements that are going on, we will miss. Or uh, Facebook is losing youth relevance. I repeat my previous comment. It's not. The only group is idealists. They're pulling out of Facebook a bit because it's become about gossip and marketing and advertising and communication. Whereas what it used to mean was that me and my five mates over there, we don't see each other that often, so we keep in contact with Facebook. That was the meaning of it, yeah? Now, I know some of you old blokes that you go to school with and I see their updates and now I'm getting suggested posts that I should like this. Uh, that's not why we kept going there, so we've gone and found something else we can do that with. But the masses, <laughs> they're still doing it. So be very careful about any statement you see that says all are, or this generation are, always be very, very careful. Because I've got the data there to kind of back it up as well. I'll have a little bit more fun with you. <coughs> we'll try a different one. 
all the men in, how many women have I got? Should be better with the women answering this. Give me some broad sweeping statements about Kiwi blokes. <laughs> Lazy, brilliant, go on, keep going. Wow. Loving that one. Sorry? Non-communication. Non I like the way Malcolm, Ma Malcolm started taking credit for changing New Zealand's non-communication, didn't he? It was all to two degrees false, according to Malcolm. What else? I think we can just go lazy, self-centred and non-communicative is really three <laughs> big ones. <laughs> Don't know about you boys, but I'm really glad I've got my British passport with me back pocket now. Okay. Here's a little study on that. Again, I'm not trying to change, educate you about Kiwi blokes. I'm just trying to prove a little bit of a point about really understanding who. What we found with the average Kiwi bloke when we did this study was that fundamentally there is a, there is a massive tension between today's Kiwi male and that of yesteryear. And really today's Kiwi male is a bit confused, like some of the blokes I'm looking at right now, but they're probably confused about me and th who they are. And what they, th this is, is it's not so much a uh, confusion, it's more of a tension. My dad, in the home, he had, and in the workplace, and as a man in social sense, had a degree of expectation. He was a bloke, yeah? In the home, he was there about strength. He provided the hunter-gatherer. You know, when it came to, you know, the, the kids, he was the disciplinarian. Wait till your father gets home. And I'm not going to hark back to the days of being able to give kids a smack, but that was Dad's job, the belt. Now, we say that now, and it sounds archaic, but I'm talking a generation ago. You know, the authority figure, the figurehead, and there were roles that he had to achieve because he was the bloke. You know, he tended to fix stuff, even when he had no idea why. But today, today's a bit different. Today, a man is not governed just by his physical strength or his macho thing. There's an emotional intelligence that we need to have and understand. As leaders or parents or whatever, we can't just turn around and say, because I said so anymore, that will get us fired and divorced. At home, we're partners. I'm not the, you know, I, I, I'm not the hunter-gatherer provider in my house. My wife brings in a bloody good piece of coin and she's got a damn good job and she's a lot smarter than me. And I can cook better than her. <laughs> so we're in a partnership. You know, when it comes to my kids, I'm taught to be more of a mentor than an, author you know, <laughs> an authoritative figure, if you like. You know, it's more about leadership, shared responsibilities, you know, and the expectations, well, it's negotiation now. Tell you what, love, I won't get home. I'll do dinners in the weekends. You do dinners there. You divide and conquer. You strategize. So for man, he hasn't got a role model today for that because that didn't happen. So he's got to try and change. So maybe his um, lack of communication is more to do with the fact that he doesn't actually know what to say. <laughs> and the laziness thing, I'm just going to say bad husband. <laughs> but what's interesting is that sometimes, and this is the real trick about getting to know your consumer, is that sometimes, and in a lot of cases, the consumer hasn't got a bloody clue. When we ask men about symbols and things that stand for being a Kiwi bloke, we got the number eight wire, the swanee, the all blacks, the beer, <laughs> dirty hands, all that stuff. But fundamentally, these men, when they pulled out all these words and said, yeah, this is it, I said, I'm not being funny, mate, but that doesn't look like you. And you go, well, actually, it's not. It's who I'm supposed to be. I haven't quite figured out who I actually am just yet. So that phrase there, in a vacuum of not knowing what the male is, men revert back to what they grew up thinking. They go back to the last reference point. So there's change going on. And nowhere is the change more evident when you start talking to men about role models. Young boys, old men, same gig. And what we're saying, back in the day, you could put a person in that seat as a role model. You know, we still put Colin Meads at the number one. Men today, I mean, we've had quite a few good all-black captains since then. 
there's been quite a few good Kiwi blokes who've done stuff since then. But in all my research, I still get the same top three. Yeah, Richie's in there now. But, you know, it's still the same stuff. It's still the same typography that's going in there. You know, because fundamentally what's happening now is men and humans are starting to look more so in New Zealand at the achievement, not the person. The reason being is because that person in today's world is so transparent. No one had a clue what Colin Meese, Sir Edmund Hillary, or any of these heroes of yesteryear what their wives were called, what they had for dinner and where they went and what their star sign was. Today, in our heroes, we get invited to their weddings by a woman's day. We know what food they like. We know, we know so much about them. And also when they fail, we know everything about the tweets <laughs> that they made. So now people have to remove away from the person and they start looking at the achievement. It was a wonderful exercise we did with some people when they started picking out their role models. There was always the yeah, but. Yeah, you know, Tiger, yeah, I know what he did with the women's bang out of order, but look how many titles he won. Yeah, I know Michael Jordan got caught shagging around as well, but he just set the benchmark so high for everybody else. There's always the yeah, but. So people look at those achievements now as role models. So, just, I suppose, in my got the last, what, five minutes, five, ten minutes. What I was trying, hopefully, I've got across is that it is a journey to understand the customer. You don't have to go out and redo it all the time. But if, if you think you know, you're screwed. Anyone who catches any of their colleagues they care about saying, I know my customer, just check them. Yeah, I'm going to give you a quick example. Google knows more about you than you would care to imagine. <laughs> or you would care to admit, more accurately. So to say you know your customer when you probably barely know your own behavior, <laughs> yeah? So the only way we keep doing it is we actually, first thing is we have to decide what our role is in that journey. That might stop us from going, I need to attract more youth. No, I don't. I need to attract more youth who are into team sports, who are looking for and who need this. Now I've got an audience I can go after and truly understand what the limits and barriers are and the opportunities that exist within that. If I go all well, youth, I'll get spinning around in a circle, we employ someone like me to come along and charge you thousands of dollars just to spin you a little bit harder. Because you guys are actually bang in the middle of your own audience every day, which is actually the beauty of I love working with sport because you are actually the petri dish of New Zealand demographics. Love it. You know, if you want to go out and watch parents, go to watch, go, you know, go out and look at the fields of New Zealand on a Saturday morning. You'll see parental dynamics that feel a play there. Yeah, you guys just, I, you have, I love what you guys have. Seriously, I think you guys have the responsibility for the greatest brand this country's got, sport. Because everyone wants to participate with you in some way, shape or form. Everyone wants to aspire to do what you've got. But the thing is, you've got to, at individual levels, is work out what that role is. And the reason I say remain curious and always listen is that just unfold the arms. You don't know. I don't know. And I do this for a living every day. I don't know the customers. I've got a bloody good idea, but I keep on going and I keep on going. And the perfect example of that, and I'll leave you with this, is that <coughs> FMCG companies make the critical mistake of always basically fighting on price. You guys, sometimes, because I've been working with sport on and off for, for, since I've been in New Zealand, I'm very lucky to have been involved, particularly in a lot of youth stuff, is I always hear the kids of today are busy, time, you know? Yeah, we need to change our availability. We need to change the cost, cost, price, time, all these things. All those things are only relevant in the absence of value. If you present a value, you can, don't have to worry about trainings on Thursdays or Tuesdays. If you present a value, it doesn't matter whether the subs have gone up 10% year on year. Everything goes up. They're trained to expect that. There's a reason the youth market are not running around today carrying Nokia 3310s and keeping Nokia alive. It's because they wanted $1,000 phones to make them look good. That had value. 
Look at a teenager, look at his feet. Ask him what he hasn't got, he'll say money. Look at his feet and there you go where his money is. In his pocket. Why? Because it has a value. You have a value. You just maybe need to make sure you own it. <laughs> you can pretty much all have a similar value. But it's actually what is it you provide. Because then you can go back and look at the type of people that we're after, know who they are, and track how they change. And that's really knowing the customer. When you get your proposition, understand them and understand where they meet. You can't just know the customer. Because that's just changing. And you've got no anchor. You're the anchor. Your strategy is the anchor. And that's why I love what I do, because I get to play with the strategy and I get to play with the consumer and dance around in the middle doing all the listening, remaining curious and always having fun. Because it is a journey and it's a real fun journey as well, because you go home sometimes and go, shit, that was cool. And hopefully one of you might walk out of that room today and say, shit, that was cool. Thank you very much. <laughs> You just said, um, Spencer, that don't think they're not outplaying because they are. Yeah. What can you tell us about that? Um, we we kind of, in, re in retail terms, we often call it m uh, maverick consumption. Oh, yeah, a product is designed to do one thing, but the consumer gets it and makes it do other things. A a and sport is a lovely version of that. I mean, ever since you grew up, I know, ever since I was knee high, you know, you, you took a couple of jumpers out and you made some goal posts and you played a game of football and before you know it, you had, you know, 25 aside. Um, I wasn't aligned to any sporting body. I wasn't involved in any sport whatsoever. I was just kicking a ball around in my back yard or out on the, on the streets with, with other kids. That is participating in that sport. I go home, I watch football on TV. I'm actually really invested in your sport, but I might not belong to a club or play it at school because at school, I go to a school that's more focused on rugby. Or actually, I'm a little weedy kid who doesn't like get involved in all that stuff. It's not my personality. Whatever. So what we've found in all our youth research is that there is a vast amount of participation and play going on in many different facets that sometimes go under or, or over our tracking, measurement or control or any of those things. Um, and in a way, that's beautiful because basically our, our, our nurturing grounds are, are, you know, are being done for us. Human nature is taking care of that for us. It's now just a case of working out how we tap into that. It's not, a, it's not something we need to stop. It's something we need to encourage. And the love of sport, which is why I love working in sport, is something that's always there. You very rarely get a group of people in terms of what you think about sport. I might not like organised sport because I might have had a crap experience with a coach or, or whatever, but I love the participation. I love the mateship. I love all of that, the emotional benefit it gives and physical ones too. Two completely different questions of things that have gone on in here while you've been speaking. And the first one, which I've always to start with, and you, and you talked about what a, what a man think and, and the confusion. And while the Cricket World Cup was on, when it finished, it really struck me, or my thoughts around, were the All Blacks versus the Cricket. And actually saying that all blokes think that the All Blacks what they need to be and they're rough and they're tough and richy and all the rest of it. Actually, the world media was saying the All Blacks were just superb. The, um, black black caps. Were just Absolutely, superb yeah. because they had that emotional intelligence. They actually did good things. The pulling up of the South Obviously. African off the yeah. ground. And that resonated. So how, if you like, what is that when you're trying to find out who your customer <laughs> but I, I will comment on that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I was one of those. I mean, I'm a cricket fan anyway, and it just made a, it made a change to be sitting in Eden Park with another forty thousand of us rather than another fourteen thousand of us. So you know I, that was like, and yes, the 
the emotional side of the game, the human side of the game came through so much more so than any other, you know, than we've ever talked about before. But again, that was a bit of a reference point because the Aussies were such, sorry for the only Aussies in the world, so at the opposite end of that scale, you know, so that kind of stood out. So uh, yes, the, it's about, for me, that was about what that is at the heart of sport, which is participation. Yeah, uh, and I don't think the all black fan versus black cap fan in that are, are two different people by any stretch. I guess, and I need to continue to work that through, mm. what is it for our kids? I would far rather have our kids aspire to what the world saw the black caps do, or the individuals playing as black caps as a team, than actually, I hate to say it, I'm sorry guys, than actually aspire to grow up to be. Uh, yeah, absolutely. But I, I just, I I'll share a bit of what Buck's left the room <coughs> from what I was doing with, uh, <laughs> rug, with, with, with rugby and trying to understand kids' participation in, 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 in rugby at an early age and dropping out. And I'll just give you one little insight from that, which I think talks to this, which is every single kid had this phrase called the car ride home. Right. So that is all about the fact I go out, I do something, I'm having fun, I screw up, I, uh, whatever it is. But then I get in the car, ride home, and everyone's a freaking expert. Mum, rah, rah, dad, rah, 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 rah. Rather than, good on you, boy. Now, you could argue one's a black cat behaviour, one's a, an all black, and I think that would be a bit of a long yeah. bow. Yeah. I think it's fundamentally understanding that the participation was more, more important. So what is, for me, the Kiwi bloke? The Kiwi bloke wants to be part of something. That's what he wants to do, and I think this, com this country does a great job of allowing people who are bloody good to be part of something, but might not just necessarily do a great job of those who just want to muck about do something. So, uh, yeah. um, the model that you just presented to us today is obviously is that, that's a New Zealand model yes. that we fit the most for. Yes. What's your perspective on if that same work was done in another country and it kind of follows on from those? Yeah. What's your perception if it was done in Australia or the UK? Would it be very significantly different? I believe so. I believe that the segments would be pretty much, in terms of w what the segments stood for, would be pretty similar. Um, but I think the sizes and what re some of the motivations within there would necessarily strengthen and weaken depending on where you went. Um, you know, I think, so for example, in the UK, you would get a different segmentation if you did London versus, say, some of the rural areas there due to immigration and different influences that have gone on there that will change certain things as well. So there is always a difference. There's a flavour. And there's always a lovely flavour in New Zealand. It is, and I'm not being condescending. It's a beautiful flavour. Do some work for a very big multinational company, and they wanted to understand what pride and trust looked like in eight different countries. Only New Zealand was different. Only in New Zealand did we say we only have pride when you overcome adversity. In other countries, pride is something you have through success. In New Zealand, it is success, but only if you've actually overcome a few, of, 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 you know, a few um, issues, adversity. And I always used to throw, yeah, but what about the All Blacks? Most successful sports team in the world, like ever. Um, but you guys give them plenty of shit. And they were like, yeah, yeah, but that'd be the World Cup, say. So we've kind of stopped that now. <laughs> yeah, there's always a story. So New Zealand is always a little bit different in, in that regard. But um, I'm still trying to find a client that's going to pay me to do it overseas, madam, so. <laughs> Um, yeah, that, that's why I love what we do is because you get this and you get segmentations for clients and organisations and you segment them and you give them two or three years and then you kind of realise, you know, you've done some different stuff because you've responded to it, thus you've trained your customer a little bit differently and there's other environmental things going on, you might need to dip back in and have a look, but what you tend to do is you have a look at what's changed, but you will measure that based on your own behaviour. You know, if you talk about, you know, we're crap at communication and you start developing apps and communication devices and all the rest, then you can turn around and say, well, see, that's not a barrier to anymore, so what's happened to that segment? So you change. So, yeah, you do go back in and, and you go check. The thing I found about Gen Y, the biggest change, was the conservatism 
that view of others and how that was something that at a very young age I'm more concerned about what else is going on in that sense of fairness and we found that in sport it's not fair the ref's crap it's not fair his dad always gets to do this it's not fair this and that was the main motivation to kick out this sense of fairness was it, it seems to be growing and growing and growing because life's unfair at the moment it's busy it's hard you know um comparatively speaking <laughs> um so for them fairness is, is the growing trend that i've noticed in, in this particular study the men one was completely new i felt like i was doing therapy yeah, definitely, definitely. And uh, I personally, I'm excited by the immigration story uh, as an immigrant myself, and also someone who, you know who grew up in London who saw the same thing happen there when we went through one of our massive immigration things, how the dynamic and the street signs and the flavours and the smells and attitudes to politics and participation and things. I mean, I see it, I'm a f you know, I play social football, you know, so I see how the, the colour of my opposition and my team changes and what that means and how we talk. So absolutely, I think you give it another five years and you start looking at the landscape, particularly of the um, urban areas of this country, and you're going to see some different stuff and it's exciting. So the analysis that you did, mm. you said Absolutely did. It did. Absolutely so were did. There any, so you didn't show those on no. the slide, but it did show, did it show different things? Certain ethnicities shine, um, oh, certain ethnicities are more representative in certain segments. When you get have a look at it, because I didn't want to go there today, you will see certain ethnicities. There's a reason we put sunglasses on the Money Status Gang. <coughs> Sir? So is it possible if your data set to mine it in a totally different way and say we'd love to find who are the people that are really in competitive sport who are into social, who feel that sport, the sports system doesn't work for them or they're not the target market, not the mm -hmm. Could we go in and bring those kind of questions and get on to that data set? You can bring that nonsense, yes. Um, but <laughs> Out of this data set, probably not, because obviously it wasn't set out to specifically look at sport. Um, it's something we do for customers and allow them to kind of build on top of and we start then looking at their customer data and, and segmenting it like by, by this. Um, and this, I don't think this is a, uh, and there's, because I hear my boss screaming as she hears me throwing away the opportunity to sell a product, but I don't see this as being something that's actually relevant for you guys beyond a think piece. This isn't going to help you size up your market and help you define your market any other. It's going to help you realize probably some of the assumptions that you've made and what you need to find out. Because the problem with knowing your customer is never the data. Because you've got tons of it. You can go and buy it tomorrow for next to nothing if you need to. Yeah? The problem you have is you don't have a question to ask. <coughs> That's the trick is understanding the right questions to ask of that data so you can then action the output. Knowing how many kids are into this certain sport just helps us understand what the pie looks like. <laughs> we don't know how to make it yet. You know, so what are the questions to work out how we actually, you know, you know, and that's why I say you always start off with going, what's my value proposition? Sincerely value proposition. What is that? Right, now, who are the type of people that need that? Now, where do, what do they look like and where do they live and what do they do and how do I talk to them? Turn the other way. <laughs>